and welcome to another episode of Tekava Vetchet. Today, we're traveling once again to Ireland, and we're speaking today to one of my personal heroes, somebody who is probably one of the most well-known veterinary faces in Ireland and also in the UK. He's not only a practicing veterinary surgeon, but also a broadcaster who is frequently seen in radio, in television, um, uh, he writes books, and to top it all, he's also quite an active sportsman as well. So everything I aspire to do, but fail to do. So he has done it. Hello and welcome to Pete Zavet or Pete Vederburn. Hello. Hello, Hi, welcome. Great, great to see you again. And you take yeah. it right back to that day of CPG that you organized so wonderfully in aid of the Ukrainian situation. That was a great weekend and well done on that again. Yeah, and thank you very much for being one of the moderators. It was it was really nice sort of having you and also Kat Zavet and uh, Mike and uh, Julian to, to, to help out. It was, I mean, I, I enjoyed the whole day. It's it was fun <laughs> as well. Yeah. So absolutely, absolutely. Hmm? Yeah. I've, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not lying where I say sort of, I, since sort of I, I met you the first time sort of, I think it was in Birmingham at BSAVA Congress. It was yeah. one of these situations where you're standing next to somebody you have personally never seen before and you know exactly who it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also yeah. happen to know that your partner, um, uh, you, uh, you, if one of Burn. your business partners is uh, mm. Andrew Byrne, our former FICAVA president. Mm. So I knew you also a little bit from there, but I thought, oh yeah, so that is the yeah. event. <laughs> so it was already a few years ago, but... Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, what, what, what I find so amazing is, I mean, you do, uh, on one hand, you're a partner in a clinic, uh, but then a considerable amount of time you also spend sort of with radio programs and uh, uh, you have frequent television appearances, both in Ireland and also in the UK. Then you, then you write books. And uh, what I find sort of uh, puzzling how do you manage to to organize that all time wise so and that, that's that's a really good question um and i think probably the the simplest answer is that it's difficult and that i mean i've been doing this now for 30 years and i think that if i look back over those 30 years i'd probably say that i made a mistake in spending so much time working and working both at the clinic and then doing the media work as well, because it's undoubtedly taken up huge amounts of my time to the extent that when my, when my daughters were younger, they're now in their mid twenties, when they were younger, I didn't spend enough time with them. Um, I was working too much. And I would say at the time it's because I had to, but with hindsight, I think it was a choice I made. And I actually think it was a wrong choice that I made in some ways, as far as the family is concerned. Um, um, and I think that actually takes me on to something that's interesting about the, the current generation of young vets who are kind of saying, we don't want to put those crazy long hours in. We want to have a better balance of work, work and life. And I think they're absolutely right. But for me these days, Wolfgang, I, I do simple answers. I do less clinical work. So I, I do about two days a week in the clinic. And that leaves me with three working days, if you like, to do media work um, and that media work is split between writing which is my main thing my main passion um, and following on from that radio work um, is a natural extension of writing which is simply verbalizing what you've written essentially um, and television work is kind of scarcer but when it comes along i really enjoy doing it and i do all these things because i firmly believe that when it comes to animal welfare the biggest hurdle is ignorance on people just don't know stuff. They just don't know stuff. And I, I'm often amazed, like I'll do a talk about um, human food that are poisonous um, to dogs. And people go, onions are poisonous, grapes are poisonous. And like, I've said these things so many, many times, but people, maybe they're just not listening, maybe they don't remember, 
And so there's, there's an ongoing need for us as vets to keep talking to the public and to keep sending out the messages about good basic animal care. And that's really the biggest thing that motivates me, spreading the word about good basic animal care. Although I sometimes think that maybe our expectations are a little bit too high of the general public, because sort of the way we see it, sort of that we tell it to one, to five, to 10, to 100 clients again and again and again, but that are just individual people. It doesn't mean that this has now arrived as general knowledge with a whole populace. There are always people sort of who haven't come across it, who haven't heard it. And I mean, we might also, I mean, I hear that so often also from colleagues that they complain, ah, oh, yeah, they phoned me with this triviality and they think that's an, uh, that's an emergency. But the thing is, they are not the specialists. How are they supposed to know? And I, I mean, that it's so great. I mean, having, having somebody like you who can translate Complex, mecha complex mechanisms to the general public, but obviously in form of a radio program or television program, sort of that is of sort of general interest. You reach far more people than, than hundreds of us uh, during consultation. You know, one of the interesting things that's happened in my life is that um, my daughter, she wants to be a vet like me. And through her school days, she used to come into our practice and see practice and look at what's going on. And then just before she left school, she one morning she said to me, Dad, I've changed my mind. I don't want to be a vet after all, because I, I know what your daily job is. I don't want to do that after all. And I said, that's fine. What would you like to do? And she said, I, wanted to, I want to study immunology. I want to study pure science. So she learned immunology. But then after that, after doing a degree in immunology, she went on and did a master's in science communication. And she's now become a professional science communicator. Mm. And that didn't used to be a profession. It's now a specific profession. And the ironic thing is that she's doing what I do because what I am is a science communicator about veterinary. Um, mm. And so accidentally she's doing just what her dad does, which is kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, well, I mean, it always rubs off, I think. So, yeah. yeah. Um, you, you, you said, I mean, you, you are doing this now for the sort of the, the media work and the, 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 um, uh, the creative work alongside sort of veterinary medicine for mm. the last 30 years. How did this start? How, what were the first steps? How did you get into that? Well, I, it's kind of logical, really, I think. Um, and the first thing I'd say is I, I think I've been very privileged and I, um, I'm not into astrology, Wolfgang, but I did want my birth chart done. And I don't know if you know about astrology, but it's all to do with where the planets are in the sky and the angles between the planets. And my birth chart was full of what's called trines. And it, in astrology speak, that means that things happen easily. And I've been ridiculously privileged in my life. And it's not very fair. So when I tell my story, I know that people will be looking at me and they'll be saying, that's a middle-aged, middle-class man who came from a wealthy enough background in a wealthy enough country. And for him, it was easy. And they're absolutely right. And I, I feel a bit bad whenever I talk about my career because I had those unfair advantages and it all just did work out for me so far. And I, I just, I think that's, one of life's unfairnesses that, that happens. But anyway, here we are, here I sit, and I might as well tell the story. So once I'd qualified as a vet for a few years, um, I started. To, I decided to do some evening classes just for fun, because I, I got to the stage of life where I didn't have to work all the time because I was reasonably comfortable with my knowledge as a vet. I wanted to look at other things in life. And the topic that I'd really neglected since school was English, studying English. And I went to creative writing classes and when I went to those classes in the evening, I very quickly learned that how you get better at writing is by writing. And so I thought, well, how can I do more writing in my life? And I, I approached the local newspaper and said, would you ever accept a column from me about pets every week? And they said, yeah, we'd love you to do that. And so I started to do that. And then I think the secret to, to working in the media is 
you you just learn never to say no and that's what i did is i have never said no so if the phone rings at the most unfortunate time um i will say when do you want me and what do you want me to talk about and i will do it it doesn't matter so this morning for example i had a radio station phone up and said um there's just been a report produced saying that the number of dog bites um that people are suing for has surged in the last two years can you talk about this in half an hour and i i said uh. absolutely no problem whatsoever and then you go away and these days with the internet it's dead easy to do you you put it into a search engine you read the article you go to your own resources about dog bites and what's caused them. And then half an hour later, you're ready to go and talk about it. And I think a lot of vets find it challenging to do that because they worry that the, the interviewer is going to trip them up or ask them trick questions or make them look bad. And I've learned over the years that, that almost never happens because generally interviewers want to have an interesting and engaging show. And that doesn't mean that they um, try to criticize the person they're interviewing, you know? so. I think never saying no means that um, media people tend to come to you because they know you're going to say yes. Um, and, and you then build up, it's a bit like compound interest. Um, you know, one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And next thing, you spend quite a bit of your life doing this stuff, really. But you know what drives me more than anything else, Wolfgang, is that I really enjoy it. I really yeah. enjoy it. Mm. It's just fun. Um, you need to you need to be a bit of an extrovert sort of to uh, I think to do that. So you to, you need to be a communicator. You need to 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 be happy to sort of put yourself a little bit out in front of it and say, okay, I'm I'm happy to speak up. And I know that at the moment there are thousands of people looking at me, and then don't freeze up or so. Mm. It's, 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 I think it's a bit of excitement as well. Like I think live television, especially, is very exciting because you because you are aware that there's hundreds of thousand people actually looking at you, and sometimes your brain will kind of go, "What would happen if I just stopped being able to think of anything at all?" And <laughs> you have those moments. Yeah. But yeah. Then you kind of go, "No, that, I can't let that happen," and just keep on going. Um, yeah, 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 and somehow, somehow, it works. Somehow, yeah. it will, it will work out. But nevertheless, I mean, especially live programs. I mean, that would freak me out because, I mean, as you said, sort of, yeah, like, can you speak in half an hour about something? Okay, at least you have half an hour quickly research what they were talking about. But if I imagine, sort of, if there are say phone ins, people phone in with all sorts of bizarre things. And yes, admittedly, sort of, we vets normally have an answer to everything, but there are sometimes things where you think, oh my God, I have well, no I I idea what this person is talking about. Well, I'll yeah. tell you, I had an interesting experience once where somebody asked me live on television, what should I feed my pet newt on? And I said, I don't know. You shouldn't have got a pet newt unless you knew what you were going to feed them on. But then what happened was afterwards, people came up to me and said, I couldn't believe you didn't know what to feed that newt on. So next time I actually told the story to a friend Then I was on the radio and a friend, I knew he was a friend. He phoned live in national radio and said, I've got a pet newt, what should I feed it on? Exactly the same question. So this time I said, hmm, well, what you should do is you should feed the newt on a balanced diet. So you need to make sure you feed the news a combination of protein, carbohydrates, fats, minerals, and vitamins. And think about what a natural diet for a newt is and try to mimic that as best you can. Next question. Yeah, yeah. You, can all, <laughs> you can always, the thing is you can always find an answer, even if it's not perhaps the answer that somebody really, really wants, you're able to give a coherent answer. And that way, um, some people will say he doesn't know what you should feel newt on, but most if you say I don't know, then the whole country knows that you don't know, you see. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but even well, but 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 even that sort of I I often or I, I, I sometimes find even I mean if 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 you say something, say if, if you write an article for the newspaper or so on on a subject, and there might be something that is not now well 
if you pick a, make a big mistake, but even then, if, if, if there's something that's not 100% correct, okay, it's of interest at the moment, next day, most people have forgotten it. So normally we don't do much damage. So unless we, we talk real rubbish. <laughs> yeah. so no, I, mean, I, I, think, I think the kind of benchmark really is you, 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 you must do your, res you have to do your research. And you have to only say things which you're very, very confident is true. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you, you do get caught out sometimes because things do change and new science comes along. And some things that we've always thought to be true. For example, a good example would be suggesting that chicken and boiled white rice is a good bland diet for recovery from gastroenteritis. Is that true? Now we've said it for years, but I think some people begin to say, well, actually, no, that's not true. There's no evidence for that. And so you do, you know, um, if you're in the media, you have to be aware of these kind of undertones and aware of how things are changing so that you don't um, tell any untruths accidentally. Because the big worry is the unknown unknowns, isn't it? It's all very well. If you knew you didn't say it, if you knew something was wrong, then you wouldn't say it. But when you don't know it's wrong because you're, haven't done your research and you think you're telling the truth and you're not that's the bit that's most worrying i think <laughs> yeah that's probably sort of true i mean that was uh, what i uh, what i find i mean i i, I, I you're writing a blog as well uh, I, I do the same thing and what i what i'm always surprised about is is how long it takes actually to write just a small article because you, you review it again and again and again. I mean, sometimes I'm in a flow, but it's quite often so that I sit there and I've written maybe two pages and four hours or something like that. And you see, how, yeah. how was that possible? It's not much or so. And I mean, for, for, for the reader, it is done in two minutes. They have sort of read what you what what took you four hours. And yeah. Yeah. Isn't that? I mean, when I talk also about time management, sort of you must find that sometimes that yeah, writing an I, article sort of. I, I think there are some tricks to the trade, if you like, and one of them would be recycling of articles. So you know, so I've written. I, I mean, I write about probably six articles a week, and I've been doing that for 30 years. So if, if I want to write an article about, let's say, about feral cats, about trap, neuter, and release programs, then it's very easy for me to search in my archives and to find something I've written about it before, and then to adapt that to the, 20, to the 2022. And, it, you know, you can, a lot of information it doesn't need to be changed very much to still keep it very, very fresh. So I think an element of recycling of, of writing is something that you can do uh, to make yourself more time efficient sometimes. You do have to be careful, you have to be careful. I did that once and an editor, they took a half a paragraph and they Googled it and they found that it been somewhere else before. You've, <laughs> you've written that before, yeah, yeah. That's obviously you. <laughs> exactly careful to make sure you don't do that yeah but the but the beauty with that is is you are confronted with um what shall i say challenges which you normally just as a consulting vet would probably never face mm? because sort of yes people talk about repetitive issues with their pets but uh in in that setting sort of people talk more about contemporary issues which might be also um, social issues like, I don't know, the brachiocephalic dogs or something mm. like that, or um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, sort of pandemics or something like that, that are at the moment in the media and discussed it. And not necessarily so that you would see these cases in practice, but suddenly mm. sort of you are put on the spot and you, you, you need to clue yourself up on these things. You do, you do. Um, and I think it's important that vets as a profession are seen to speak up on all sorts of areas. I think, I don't know if you've seen Sean Wensley's book yet, have you? Oh. Mm. He's Sean Wensley is a, a British yeah, vet. I, Sean Wensley is doing Vet Sustain. Mm? 
He's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's written the most wonderful book, which really outlines the, a lot of the, what you might call the political or the, the animal welfare issues of our day, you know, from broiler hens to battery hens to pig farming um, to uh, racehorse issues. He's done a lot of stuff, really, really great book. And I, I think the more the vets get out there and talk to the world about these issues, the better. If you're a young vet, sort of uh, like sort of you were some years ago, um, not so many years ago, <laughs> but you you think, okay, I like veterinary medicine, but I also am an outgoing person. I, I would like to do some sort of make something out of sort of my creative sort of side. And I would like to, to write about uh, that, what I'm doing, or would like to get involved in radio or any other form of broadcasting. What would be your suggestion how to, how to make a start on that? Yeah. Well, I think the main thing I'd say to people is, is look for opportunities. Um, you know, I'm a great believer in, you know, setting goals and, uh, and, and systematically pursuing them. So like when I decided I wanted to do more freelance writing, um, I literally searched for how to become a freelance writer. And I discovered that you had to have a, a website that showcased your writing. And this is a long time ago now, this is like probably 20 years ago. The websites are quite new. So, and then I discovered that you're meant to write to editors and see if they'd like to. So I, I just learned about all what you had to do to become a freelance writer. And I, I think I say that to anybody, if you want to do something, then you make it into a goal for yourself and you set, you set steps towards achieving that goal. And it's, um, like I say, I, I feel, um, I find it difficult saying this because I just feel I've been, um, unfairly privileged in what's in how things have turned out for me and I like I have had a successful career doing these things that it, uh, um, I had a leg up which most people wouldn't have it was easier for me than it was for most I'm not saying everybody can do that but I'm saying that that's probably the best way to start is to systematically make it um, an ambition of yours in fact I go further than that a friend of mine who's a international life coach Took me into a pub one day and said to me what would your craziest most ambitious possible goal be and he said write it down so i wrote this thing down he said now what's you how are you going to get there and i said well obviously i'm not going to get there. i'm not going to do what i've just written down that's just insanely um over ambitious he said yes but even if you never get there if you just take steps towards getting there you're going to move further along the road than you are currently. And that's what you should do. I think that's not bad advice. Write down your biggest, hairiest, craziest thing that you might want to do. Um, and work. if you work towards that, then you're going to get somewhere that's closer to that than where you currently are. And that's probably not bad advice. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And be brave, take risks, I think. Sort of, I mean, you only live once and... Uh, yeah, and, and that's both kind of, you know, more than that, not only do you only live once, but in our culture, if it does go wrong, you're not going to end up homeless and destitute on the street, you know? Um, okay, you're, you're going to be a bit worse off and you're going to waste some money and some time, but that's about as bad as it is. So, so what you're risking isn't as much as it might feel. One, one other thing sort of interests me because I, you, alongside all this sort of the clinical work and also the, all the writing sort of, you, whenever I sort of uh, uh, no, we get, try to get in contact with you also, or not what not whenever, but, but it's quite often so that also then, nope, I'm out and running or I'm out and cycling. So how, what, what role does sort of sports and exercise play for you? Well, do you know, I think, it's just a weird thing for me is that exercise has always been a necessary part of my day. And I, when I go, I used to write a diary when I was like a teenager. And when I was like 14 years old, I used to go for a run for half an hour before, before school. And like, for me, that's just been part of my life. And if I don't do that, I just get into a bad mood and don't feel that things are right. And so, um, 
And so I was always a runner. And then after I've been running so much for many years, I started to get a really sore lower back. Like I couldn't lift up a dog anymore because my back was still sore. So I then took up swimming to try to correct that. And it worked. I never had a sore back since then. Um, and um, then I discovered that triathlons were running and swimming and cycling. And it wasn't much of a stretch. And, and what I discovered was that you can, if you go running every day, you damage yourself in some way because of the repetitive strain. Whereas if you split it up between running some days and swimming some days and cycling some days, then no one bit of your body is overstressed. And you can and you can do your half an hour or an hour of exercise every day, which everybody tells us that we should be doing anyway for our own health. And so I try to see exercise really in the same way as I see eating and sleeping, as in just something that you have to do. And I know for myself that the bits of my life where I stopped doing it all together, I, I basically just stop being as happy. That's the best way to put it. I think some people meditate. Um, I, I don't really like meditating very much, but I think when I go for a run, it's kind of a bit like meditating. Or when I go for a sea swim and I'm going through the seawater and there's kind of bubbles all around and I'm sort of stretching as you swim, you stretch your arms and you're, it's kind of like a meditation a kind of mindful moment of some kind so for me all that exercise is it's, it's part of the necessary structure of life for me and it keeps me physically and mentally in a kind of roughly the right place I guess I think everybody's different it's hard to have a prescription for that I know you do a lot of running don't you Wolfgang no it was exactly that what you say I mean it's not only running sort of I, I, I quite agree if it is just running not good for your body. So if I, no. I, I mean, one of my favorite sports, cross country skiing, possibly not so useful if you are in the UK, <laughs> but for example, the Nordic countries sort of, uh, yeah. uh, yes. I mean, last winter, for example, I was out skiing every day for, for, for three months in a row. So that was fantastic. Um, mm. uh, but yeah, to diversify sort of, if I feel, uh, legs are a little bit heavy and the joints are not too good so then i rather do cycling or so some mountain biking or something like that or as i said go for a swim although i'm not a, a great swimmer but just do a different sort of exercise to uh, uh to try to sort of uh, uh, uh yeah um uh, pay attention to that but i personally think it is super important especially in our job and also traditionally i find that not a lot of vets of our generation sort of that that uh, uh, paid enough attention to regular exercise it was just partially because of the job we were doing but partially because at least sort of at hanover vet school there was never the culture of appreciating sort of uh uh, physical achievements. Mm? Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember sort of once in the university newspaper when I was at vet school, um, a sports achievement was recognized, and that was because one of our alumni, uh, of uh, uh, yeah, uh, fellow students, uh, won the gold medal at the Olympics in fencing. Right. But you had to be at that level that your yeah. alma mater recognized you. If you were regional champion, or if you were even just a German champion in something or so, and so what? Really? We are veterinarians, really? we don't yeah. care about sport. That always I found a bit better in the Anglo-American uh, uh, universities and, and in that environment. That's interesting. But I mean, I think it's, it's, to me it's curious that like the veterinary profession prides itself in being science-based and evidence-based. And all the evidence is that you should exercise fairly heavily for something like an hour, three or four times a week. That's what you should do to keep your body healthy. Yet, I don't think most people would do that. It would, it would, it would be unusual. People do it. So it seems strange to me. It just seems like very logical that we should all do that. And I know it's difficult. I know, again, I go back to this thing of feeling well, Maybe it's just easy for me because if that's how I've landed in my life. And I know for a lot of people, it's much more difficult than that. Maybe they live in areas where they can't do it. Maybe they have dietary or disease issues that make it difficult for them. But yeah, um, but, but, but you make an effort to fit, to squeeze it in. 
it is just an important thing. And as you said, if you don't exercise for a couple of days, then you don't feel right. You you are unhappy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think though, Wolfgang, I think it's probably that I am simply addicted to exercise. And oh yeah, we 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 are, we are endorphin addicts, definitely. <laughs> we are. Yeah, yeah, but 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 I I not feeling bad about it so but this, this see, to, to make life also a little bit fun and i mean that's the same thing i mean what you're doing also with veterinary medicine it's not you're not just treating animals you just do take also the fun side out of it sort of by sort of looking okay how how can i look at it in a funny on an interesting way from a different angle and uh, uh i think that sets well, that, that is why you, well, why, why life, why well, you keep life so entertaining. And also, I mean, veterinary medicine, sort of why it's still sort of giving you a kick. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I, think, I think having a good mix of stuff going on in your life is a good way of keeping yourself interested in everything. I know for myself, the times when I found veterinary most difficult have been when I've had to work 60 hour weeks of just doing clinical work. And I find that very, I find that difficult to the point of almost descending into mental health issues when I work those long hours because it's a very stressful, uh, emotionally ch and intellectually challenging job. And if you don't have enough uh, escape from it, it can be overwhelming, can't it? Absolutely. Pete, thank you so much for this interview, for this vet chat. Um, if anyone would like to comment on this episode of Recover Vet Chat, or if you have good ideas for new Recover Vet Chats, please email us on vetchat at recover.org. I hope to see you soon for another Recover Vet Chat. Thank you very much and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Wolfgang. Good to see you.